In this video, we're going to be talking about whether you should be waiting on the sidelines right now in the Australian property market, or whether you should be actually jumping in and buying your first or next investment property right now. So if you're not sure whether to start investing right now or not, then this video is going to give you the exact answer to that question using 15 reasons. These are not the reasons you hear from the media. These are not the reasons you hear from other podcasters or other YouTubers or on Facebook. These are data-driven reasons. So my name is PK and I help people build passive income by buying property that has a combination of positive cash flow and capital growth. Yes, it's possible without using a buyer's agent and without catching flights, running around the country on weekends, doing inspections with data. All right. So if you watch my channel, if you enjoy it, if you get value out of this video, hit the subscribe button, click the thumbs up icon, give it a like, give it a love, you know, turn on the notification bell. And that way YouTube sends this video to more and more people, which obviously is good for me, but it's good for you because you see more of this type of content. And if you're on my Facebook group, thank you. There's more than 7,000 of you clients and investors in that Facebook group. Thank you for being with me. Tag someone that would benefit from this video who's not sure whether to buy right now or not and share. Okay, guys, so let's, let's get into it. So I know that so many of you are still thinking, despite the boom that we're right now within, that, hey, should I, you know, am I taking a gamble by buying in a property market that is so hot and it might fall? That's what you're thinking. Or you're thinking, hey, you know, am I missing out on the wave? Am I missing out on all the fun? Should I just jump in now, even though I should have jumped in six months ago when PK was telling me to do that? So this, uh, this video will give you the answer. Now I'm going to talk about 15 reasons, data-driven reasons on the supply side and on the demand side. But the first point I want to make and this first point, hopefully it blows your mind. If it doesn't, then you should have already invested. The first point is that there is no one round property market in Australia. There's no singular market at any point in time, whether it's 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, two months ago, or right now in this moment, right here, there are markets that are going up in value. There are markets that are going down in value. There are markets that are plateauing and going sideways. There is no single stock, um, property market. There are 15,000 suburbs in Australia. Just like, you know, for a lot of you, you guys invest in um, the, the, the stock market. So in the stock market, the ASX 300 might be increasing. The ASX 300 might be reducing in value, but there are always stocks that are increasing the other way, and there are always stocks that are decreasing the other way, counter cyclically. So similarly, in the property market, there are 15,000 suburbs in Australia. Think of them as stocks in the stock market. Each of them has individual supply di and demand dynamics. For those of you in Sydney, Melbourne, who are kind of tearing your hair out thinking property investing sucks from between 2017 and 2021, well, actually, you could have doubled your money in so many places around Australia, such as Hobart, um, around Bendigo, Ballarat, Orange, um, other regional areas within New South Wales and Victoria, places like Adelaide. So many places were booming. There's always markets that you can invest in that will go up right now, whether you ask this question right now or in two years or five years or 10 years. So is it the right time? I'll go into the data, but is it the right time to be investing? Yes, it is always the right time to be investing. I know that kind of sell, sounds self-serving of me, but that's just a fact. There are always, there's always a good time to be investing in property provided you know where. If you don't know where, then don't invest because it's, it's a big gamble. If you know where, then you should always be investing. But here are the 15 odd reasons. Let's see if we can go more or less. 15 data-driven reasons why it actually makes sense to invest right now, even if you have missed out on this year's boom so far. And the reasons why this boom ain't stopping anytime soon. All right, so I've made some notes. I'm gonna, to some extent, read from them. So the first one is on the supply side. So all things in life, price is always dictated by supply and demand. Even uh, even sort of, you know, funny things and soft things and, and fluffy things like market sentiment and all this sort of thing. It all comes down to supply and demand. Sentiment is a product of demand. But let's get into it. Supply. So the first one, resale stock. So the supply of dwellings listed for sale right now is literally 20% lower than two years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Like we are right now in an environment where there's hardly anything for sale. 
and low stock volumes, and this is record low stock volumes right now, low stock volumes mean that even if demand wasn't high, supply is so low that prices will still increase, right? And demand is actually high, but that's, that's number one. I won't labor the subject because I have a lot to get through. Number two, rental stock. So the number of properties available for rent across Australia have actually fallen sharply from the last three years to right now. Like it's gone down huge percentages. And what we are seeing is that actually in so many markets around Australia, and if you're a renter, you know what I mean, it's hard to find a place to rent. Like in some places around Australia, like Bundaberg, for instance, people are camping out because they just literally can't find a rental property to rent. In some places around Australia, it's actually really sad. Like we're in, we're in a capitalistic society, so don't, don't blame me, blame the game. But because of supply de demand dynamics, people are actually auctioning to find a place to rent. So not to buy, but they're actually bidding each other higher and higher to actually win a successful rental property to rent in. So the rental stock is at you know, record lows, and that's a real problem because A, um, you know, if you want to rent, that's, you know, it's hard to find something, but from an investment perspective, and I'm just qualifying this, we live in a capitalistic, capitalistic society, don't blame me, for an investor, this is great because there is record number of tenants looking for, for rental properties, but hardly anything out there. So that does is increases um, rents and reduces vacancy rates. But supply is very low, so that's the second thing. Third thing, uh, new stock. Now, supply is the enemy of growth. Not many people understand that. Everyone looks at population and demand side metrics. All the metrics that I'm sharing with you right now are uncommon. People don't understand them. But number three on the supply side is new stock. So new dwelling commencements or new builds over the two years ending, you know, basically last year were about 15 to 20 percent low, lower than the previous two years. So this is even despite all the grants and everything that were given. So even though buildings have, uh, approvals have increased more in recent times, in the last two years, they were very, very, very low. What that means is that demand was high, hardly any new stock is coming into the market, relatively speaking, versus let's say 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So once again, low stock means that prices go up. So those are three reasons on the demand, on the supply side. Let's have a look at the demand side. So the first, the first thing I want to say is that for the first time this year in 2021, after a long time, probably after about six or seven years, all of our, you know, government or prudential regulatory bodies are on the same page. So RBA wants prices, house prices to increase, to bolster the economy. APRA they want sustainable house prices, not booms and busts, but sustainable price rises. Um, and also the government, so much stimulus is coming into the economy. All of these three bodies are in sync. Whereas let's say in 2017, APRA was like, no, 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 no. We want to put the brakes on the property market. But now all of them are flooding um, the, uh, the property market with so much stimulus, so much favorable policy um, that you know, prices and demand are, is increasing. So really, the people underestimate how much of an impact regulatory bodies can have. But by lending policy and other things like that, that makes a remarkable difference. Okay, so the next thing is to expand upon that is APRA. Now, what they're doing is that they're actually planning on um, and actually have, to some extent, at least, loosened credit policy. Now, basically, everyone who buys a property in Australia gets a mortgage. So if they turn off the tap, APRA, in terms of your ability to get a mortgage by making lending policy much more difficult for banks, then that impacts the entire property markets like in 2017. But right now, APRA is not doing that. In fact, responsible lending, um, not the greatest name for a policy, but responsible lending is coming to an end, most likely. So all of these things mean that there is more and more ability for banks to lend money, which is how, is how they make money. And when they lend more and more, then people get more and more mortgages and buy more and more houses. So it's another demand side metric. The cost of credit, so interest rates are at record lows. Everyone goes on about how interest rates, when they rise, the property market will crash. Guys, the property market was booming back in 2013 and or 12, and interest rates were like two, 3% higher. So that's not gonna make a big difference, right? But right now the cost of credit is very, very low. So that's another, I think we're up to number three or number four on the demand side, why this boom is not um, abating anytime soon. Now, number five, I think we're up to number five, um, buyer inquiries, like so people looking for houses on domain and real estate. You can actually track views and unique links and unique clicks and things like that. 
All of this is at record levels. We call it online search interest. And that is not abating. It's a good leading indicator of what's to come. And on the demand side, that is going from strength to strength to strength. So even though many of you guys are thinking, hey, you know, is this the right time for me to buy? Actually, you're spending every day <laughs> on realestate.com looking at properties, right? So that is a great leading indicator and it's not abating. Um, first, homeowners are in the market in the biggest way, this is number six, in the biggest way for the last decade, right? So the first homeowner deposit scheme and various state government schemes that have broken down entry barriers for first homeowners, you know, they've all come in and that is really what's driving this boom. And I want to make the point that when a boom is driven by investors, it can be a little bit bubbly, if you know what I mean. It can not crash, but it can correct. But when a boom is driven by first homeowners or by owner occupiers, they're not moving out of those houses, right? They, they're perched. The last thing they want is to sell that place. And so that boom becomes much, much more sustainable. And you hear, you heard it from me in the middle of last year when everyone else was saying, don't buy property. I was saying buy property and you would have done incredibly well in the last 12 months. But I'm saying to you right now, the next 12 months, you will be doing really bad if you haven't made at least 50 or $100,000 more on an average $400,000, $500,000 property than today, right? That's, I'm going as far as to say that. All right, so up to like number seven or something like that. Um, so working from home, right? A lot of people are changing their lifestyle habits and they're needing an office space at home or at least they're needing more space at home because they're not commuting into work as much. What that means is that uh, more and more people need more space at home. They're upgrading, they're changing their dwellings, and that drives activity in the real estate market. Activity is obviously a sign of demand. So that's another thing that is really underpinning this current boom, not by investors, but by owner-occupiers. All right. Another thing that will definitely happen or continue to happen is already happening. Australia has a reputation in the world of having the best COVID response. Now, whether if you're in Victoria, you agree with that or not, I think people are calling it COVID right now. Um, whether you agree with that or not, the reality is Australia is way better off than basically most other countries. And so lots of expats, like tens of thousands of expats are returning back home, driving property prices up. And I can tell you as soon as the immigration uh, tap is opened, we will get an influx of immigrants, whether that's your cup of tea or not, we will get an influx of immigrants more than we've ever seen before. And the government will really need that to fill the labor shortage in Australia right now. So that'll be a huge catalyst to even further demand. All right, next one, I think we're up to number eight or something like that. Um, I'm looking at my notes. So various state governments have changed their stamp duty requirements. For example, uh, Melbourne uh, did the 50% discount. Uh, New South Wales was considering abolishing stamp duty, and that might still be on the cards. So all these things make the initial property purchase from an uh, investor or from an owner-occupier so much more cheaper. Of course, you know, they get you with higher land tax, but for the average person, they're just thinking, can I buy a property? And all of a sudden, properties become so much cheaper because there's less stamp duty to pay or no stamp duty. So as in the, when those policies really kick into gear, you know, every time one of those policies kick into gear, that's like one more step up the boom, further momentum to increase the property market performance. So that's another demand side metric. Another one is that there's an additional 15 billion with a B infrastructure spend um, committed over the next four years by the federal government. So they're more reliable than state governments um, and an all time high record of investment in infrastructure by basically each and every state government. This is to boost the economy. People don't realize this, right? So once again, you've not even seen the effects of this start. And I talked about in a separate video about the five biggest infrastructure projects you need to know about. There are even bigger ones coming. So that's like, what is it, number nine on the demand side. Um, there are seven, number 10 on the demand side, there are, there's so many industry sectors that need to expand their workforce in the short term. So things like advanced manufacturing, health, agriculture, um, renewable energy, defense, even without this whole COVID thing, these areas of the economy needed much more skilled workforce. So regardless of the immigration tap or not, we need these people to come from somewhere overseas or trained within locally to fill that void. And that will increase incomes, that will bring more, more, more people to Australia, to various parts of Australia, increase house, housing demand. Okay, and the last thing that I want to, to talk about is really 
really the biggest tips that you can take away from this video of how to actually use the information that I've just shared with you and put it into action, right? So I talked about three supply side factors that mean that supply, which is an enemy of growth, will really stay quite constrained over the next few years and push house prices further up. I talked about 10, I didn't think we got to 15, about 10 demand side factors, and these aren't the common ones that you hear about all the time, but 10 demand side factors that will further add more fuel to the fire. Uh, I'm not saying that the housing boom will gain even further momentum and grow at a steeper rate, but it's not cooling down anytime soon, all right? Apart from your cyclical forces, naturally in the winter time, um, house prices grow less than in the summer or springtime. So those, you know, normalizing for cyclical adjustments, the housing boom will continue at its current rate um, according to this data. But what can you do if you are on the fence about whether you should wait or whether you should buy your next investment property or house right now. Here are the two or three or four things that you can do right now. The first thing, I did a video about apartments and how you should never touch them. Tip number one, if you're thinking about buying, still don't buy an apartment, all right? Apartment uh, dynamics haven't really improved so much across the capital cities, maybe except for Hobart. So you don't really want to buy an apartment. Even if you only have $400,000, don't do it. I did a whole separate video a few days ago about why. So watch that video and don't make that mistake. The second tip I want you to know is you need to contain your own confirmation bias. All right. So I know you listen to your friends, your colleagues, the mainstream media, news.com.au, and you kind of have this impression of what the property market is and what it will do. Put that confirmation bias aside just because the herd is saying one thing doesn't mean it's right. Are all of those people that are saying those things to you multimillionaires or do they have a six-figure passive income from property? If no, then rely on data, not what they say. There is no one single property market. There are 15,000 suburbs and there are always areas, always suburbs that will go up in value now and sustainably over the long term. The question is not should you buy into the property market right now, but where should you do it? And contain your confirmation bias when doing that. And the third th tip I want to give you is be really smart when selecting locations. I've done to so many videos on data, exactly what you need to look at. So start by analyzing all the 15,000 suburbs. Don't just look at Sydney, don't just look at Melbourne, don't even just look at Queensland. Like a lot of you people, um, even myself, we're guilty of like saying, all right, Queensland affo is affordable, that's my next investment location. Analyze every opportunity available, and there are 15,000 suburbs in Australia, not just Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland. All right, the fourth tip that I want to give you is you know, the, in the, the individual suburb or the individual town or local government area that you invest in always, always, always plays such a more bigger role, such a more bigger role, such a um, larger role in predicting capital growth than the individual property. Oh, let me say that again and, and connect with this point. Where you invest is more important than the specific property that you invest in. The location does the heavy lifting, location, location, lo location. So if you're kind of obsessing about, you know, train stations, shopping centers, bricks and mortar of a property and, you know, whether there's amenity and all this kind of stuff, that's good to know, but really the underlying supply and di demand dynamics, which you can quantify yourself um, with a bit of education, my YouTube channel is all free. Um, you can do this and you can find the right location. Don't obsess on the property first, obsess on the location first. And the last thing I want you to know, and the last tip or the fifth tip is really... I want you to never sacrifice growth for positive cash flow and never sacrifice positive cash flow for growth. So it's like, well, that's a conundrum. In other words, go for both. Always build passive income by buying properties with a combination of growth and passive income or, or and uh, positive cash flow. You can do this without using a buyer's agent using data. I'll leave a link below um, with a free case study where you can find out more. But guys, if this video gave you any value, if you understood any more data than you did before um, 20 minutes from now, then give it a thumbs up, hit the like button, hit the love button, subscribe, turn the notification bell on, and share it with someone who's actually going to value a data-driven approach to property investing. Question is, is now the right time to invest? Yes, it is, even more so if you know where, okay? Hopefully that succinctly answers your question, guys. My name's PK, and I wish you all the very best. Take it easy.